All right, y'all turn to Luke 23. We're going to continue our study, but let's go to Luke 23. Now, we're talking about the death of Stephen, and I told y'all earlier how much he resembled Christ in his death. And of course, because he's being conformed to his image. And as we get closer to death, our sanctification ramps up. Now, I'm not saying that Stephen was sinless when he left this earth. I'm just telling y'all that one of the things God has so ordained is that sin has an effect on our physical body. And as we get older or closer to death, our sanctification ramps up because we begin to face more and more trials and tribulations. But as Stephen is about to leave this world, can y'all not see the Lord just pouring forth uh, just the power of the Lord on him? I mean, to say to the people stoning you, look, I'm, I'm afraid to say if you stone me at this moment, I'm scared that my last words would be, get them, Lord. And it, they shouldn't be. What they're doing is what natural people do. By nature, that's what we do. But I want to notice uh, one thing about the difference. Okay, in 23, Luke 23, verse uh, 34, it says, um, Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Y'all know that statement. Okay, now come down to verse 46. When Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. So Jesus dies right here, and as he's dying, what does he say? He says, Father, Father, forgive them, yeah, but Father, receive my spirit. So Jesus knew that his spirit was about to go to the Father, right? Yeah. Hey. <clears throat> Y'all go back over to Acts 7. In Acts 7, 59, they're stoning Stephen. And again, Stephen says the same thing, but I want y'all to notice a subtle difference. Verse 59, they stoned Stephen, calling upon God, okay, and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Now he calls upon God, but instead of calling on the Father, who does he call on? He says, calls on the Lord Jesus Christ. Receive my spirit. Now someone would say, well, that's right, the Father and the Son are in perfect agreement, and they are, but there's something very subtle here that's important. What did Christ do when he went up? He received the kingdom. Who now is the king of the kingdom of God? Christ. And during this time, look, again, the Puritans would refer to this as the kingdom mediatorial. I don't even know if that's a a word we even use. But in other words, what it means is, from the time of His ascension till He comes back, the kingdom is under the control of Christ and He's our mediator. Now, in we're told in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, when He comes back to get us, that then the kingdom will be delivered back to the Father, won't it? And so the period of time we live in is between these, isn't it? Well, Stephen lived between these. And Stephen said to Christ, receive my spirit. You know, Christ had taught the believers. He said in a parable one time, he said, the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is like this. It's like a man going on a far journey to receive a kingdom. And while he's gone, he gave his, his subjects some stuff to work with, didn't he? When he comes back after a long time, what's he going to do? He's going to judge his subjects. Who's the king that went away for a long time? Christ. Remember, he told them, I go to receive a kingdom. And he said, as my father's given me a kingdom, now I give you a kingdom. So this is why Stephen prays to Christ. Christ is our head. He's our mediator. And Stephen goes directly to him, doesn't he? Is Stephen ignoring the father? He's acknowledging that through the, uh, Christ only do we come to him, okay? And it also said, by the way, that Stephen did this. Put Stephen down here. Stephen did this, what? Full of the Holy Ghost. Now y'all look, any portion of God missing there? No, not at all. <clears throat> okay. Um, all right, let's see. What about Christ standing? There are people that make a big deal about Christ standing at God's right hand. And various forms of dispensationalism make this a huge point. I once heard a man teach this. He said, Christ stood at that moment because he thought he was coming back, that the Jews had rejected the kingdom, and he didn't know about the mystery or the mysterious church age. You know, the whole parentheses thing. And so they said, he stood, and literally this man put it this way, Christ stood to, to bring judgment on Israel. 
Israel and God the Father grabbed him and said, Not yet, son. There's a mystery you don't know about. Does that sit well with anyone in here? What does that say about Christ in glory? That he doesn't know something. Folks, he's at the right hand of God today. In his flesh on earth, he was subject to certain things that he didn't, uh, he didn't receive the knowledge of willingly, like the date of the second coming and that sort of thing. But today, is there any chance that at the right hand, Christ stood up and God said, no, 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 son, not, no, no. And they, they make a big deal over him standing. All that standing says to me is, to, maybe I'm wrong, but it just shows to me that he's standing to receive Stephen. I mean, can y'all I mean Stephen sees him? For what purpose did Stephen see him? For Stephen's own strength. Well, then who, what does he see? He sees Christ reaching out. I mean, come on, wouldn't that lift you up? And so don't make more out of it than it is. Never form a doctrine over something so slight as that if you don't have other scripture to verify it, okay? Um, all right. Although all hell raged on earth, y'all notice, Stephen is safe and settled in heaven, isn't he? Matter of fact, we read that he fell on sleep. Now, what portion of Stephen fell on sleep? His body. His body. Stephen's soul and spirit did not sleep. That's why he said, Father, receive my spirit, because your spirit never sleeps. Look, God's shown us this even in this life. Does your spirit and soul ever sleep? No. When your body goes to sleep, what does your spirit and soul do? They go right on functioning, don't they? Yeah. He, I dream stuff sometimes. I wake up and I wonder what in the world is causing Do you all do that? Yeah. And what I find is I find that it's my soul because our soul, it's like a hard drive in a computer. From the very first second you became, it's been recording information, hadn't it? Learning. And what is our dreams basically? It's stuff that we've taken in. It's coming out. Our thoughts, our worries, our concerns, whatever it is. And it's coming out it. It. And so all you really get there is you get the idea that even while my body is asleep, well, my mind's still going, isn't it? And that's because your mind, your soul, your spirit never sleep. They go to be with the Lord. So Stephen's body, I'll put it in green, okay? I'll put Stephen down here physically. Stephen's flesh went to sleep. Only the saved in Scripture are said to fall on sleep. When the lost die, folks, their spirit and soul are just as eternal as ours. You know, someone said once uh, here recently, I forgot who it was, they said, you know, everybody has eternal life. And that's true. The question is, where are you going to spend eternity? Because Stephen's body died, his soul goes to be with the Lord. When the, de when the lost in Scripture die, it says they perish perish. You ever thought about that? They just waste away. And yet even they are going to get a new body before being cast in the lake of fire. But where does their soul and spirit go? Immediately down. Uh, down, I don't saying that that's the direction it's in. In Scripture, heaven is seen as up to give us the idea of above and hell is beneath. But I do find it interesting that in the center of the earth is this lava and fire. You know, I don't, I don't, maybe God did that just for our own you know, thinking so we could picture these these sorts of things. Um, y'all, I've told y'all before about Polycarp, haven't I? Y'all familiar with Polycarp? If you're not, there is a real good movie on, might be on Amazon, a real good documentary about Polycarp. Polycarp was one of John, the apostle's disciples. And Polycarp wrote uh, some of the oldest letters that we have. Uh, he wrote to the you know, churches. And he came after John, and he was a leader of the church. And Polycarp was put to death by the Romans when they were forcing the Christians to um, worship Caesar. Polycarp wouldn't. He was 86 years old, and they did not want to kill him because killing an old man didn't, you know, I mean, he, the, the guy wanted him to recant and worship Caesar, and he wouldn't. And they fed him to the lions, if I remember correctly. But anyway, Polycarp has this quote. He wrote this now in his life. He said, talking about the incident with Stephen, watch how this is almost prophetic. Let us then be imitators of Christ's patience, and if we suffer for Christ's namesake, let us glorify Him, for He has set for us this example in Stephen. Do you all know how Polycarp died? Just like Stephen. They told him to recant, and he said for however long he had been saved, I think he'd been saved like 70 years. He said for 70 years he's been a faithful Savior to me. How could I deny Him now? And so they fed him. And guess how he died? 
They said that Polycarp, rather than just standing there and letting the lions get him as an old man, started running toward the lions. Can you imagine? Why? Committing suicide? No. I suspect he might have saw you know, something like this, but whatever it was, did he die in you know, horrible pain and agony? No, he didn't. And so that's the Polycarp. I and mean, you can read about many saints that have died that way. All right, my question is here. Are we prepared to die that way? I can tell you sitting here, nope, I ain't brave. I'm scared of pain. Don't hold your hand up. No, but I know this. If Polycarp had not been emboldened by God, Polycarp would have been scared too. If Stephen had not been emboldened by God, he'd have been scared. I know that if it comes to something like that, God has promised He'll give us the strength, won't He? Yeah. Well, we got to trust that, don't we? Yeah. He, I know y'all get tired of the same story, but I love the story of John Huss. He, they're going to burn him in the flames. Look, the Roman Catholic Church is going to burn this man. It might even, yeah, it, they're going to burn him. And they're going to burn him for what? Trying to get the people the Word of God. Now, why did Rome want to keep the Word of God out of the hands of the people? Control. Because you, as soon as you read it, you know, wait a minute. <laughs> I mean, I read Matthew 1 through 6 as a teenager, and I knew, uh-oh, I ain't doing something wrong here. But when John Huss wouldn't deny, they threw him in prison, and he's worried, just like I would be. He said, I'm going to die tomorrow. I need strength. I'm not a brave man. And they're going to burn him. I can't imagine burning at the stake, and they burn a lot of people that way. But that night in his cell, his friend come to visit him, and he was trying to get up the strength. He was trying everything he could and there was a, a candle or a lantern in there and he prayed and he brought his hand down over it and as it got down over the flame it started to burn him and he pulled away and he started crying. He said if I can't take the flame of this candle how am I going to take the flames tomorrow? The next day when they lit the killed him. You know what he told them? They said recant. He said light the faggots. The faggots is what they called the sticks, right? Light it. And as they light it and he's dying guess what he did? Screamed? Nope. Hollered? No, he sang hymns to God. How? He had the strength. God gave him the strength. Now you say, well, why did God do that? Because he loves him? Well, yeah, because he loves him, but also because all things work together for good. There was a big crowd of people there that day that saw him die. Mm -hmm. And guess what happened? Well, that you think. Some of them really thought about what they saw. People got saved. Mm -hmm. Now what about as they're killing Stephen? Saul. You know, I don't know if this is, I have no idea when he says it's hard for thee to kick against the pricks to Saul. For whatever reason, did Saul witness the death of Stephen? Did he see the way he died? Now later, the same Jesus Christ that Stephen saw at the right hand of God appears to Saul in glory, doesn't he? The difference is Stephen saw him and wanted to go towards him. Paul sees him and what happens? He hits the ground blinded. But it's the same man that was killing the Christians that God's going to now use to turn around and save them. Isn't that incredible? I, 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 that's one of the greatest things in all of Scripture to me. God showed the power that He has and the proof that He's controlling the kingdom is, He said when a strong man has his goods, unless a stronger man comes, he can't take what belongs to him. Well, what did He take when He took Saul? took Satan's main man. Who was the guy leading the charge to extinguish the church? Saul. And when God got ready, what did he do? He reached down and saved Saul. I mean, you talk about showing, you know, the casting out of a devil. That's, that's it. Okay. Um, so, the stoning and the death did not draw rage from Stephen. Instead, what did it do? More Christ-likeness. It, it, it brought him into more Christ-likeness. This is, this is how God works. Okay? <clears throat> now, how do me and you reply to attacks? I find that if I react, it's going to be wrong every time. When I react, my reaction is always personal, it's offense, it's stupid. But if I stop and don't react and I think on it and I wait and I think about it, you know what I can do? I can remember that I did all those same things. I acted just like this. I thought the same thing you think. It, 
It's all the same, isn't it? So let's all try and get in the habit of not reacting. You know, it's best to bite your tongue first, isn't it? Proverbs speaks of the wisdom of a man that speaks slowly, huh? He said, a fool is rash with his mouth. <clears throat> so whenever they're, they're stoning Stephen, and me and you read about this, the thing you and I need to get out of it again is that God can give us strength even in the time of persecution. Whatever faces us, look, whatever's coming in our country, I don't know. I'm not a prophet, and I don't believe anybody is today. If things don't change, persecution's coming. I promise you that. Things might change. I don't know. But me and you need to be ready, don't we? Did Jesus prepare the men for their persecution? Yeah. He told them, here's what's going to happen to you in this world. Okay? So me and you need to think that way. Now let's talk about Saul with the time we've got left. Um, Paul witnessed all these things. He participated in them, and not only participated in them, but he was emboldened to persecute himself by the killing of Stephen. Because here's a young man that all of a sudden holds their coats, and they kill him, and what happens to him? Nothing. Rome did nothing. So now what does Saul do? Saul's emboldened. So Saul's now going to do what's been in his heart. What do you think kept uh, people from persecuting more before this? self-preservation. Y'all know nobody wants to go to jail or get in trouble with Rome, do they? So when it looks like there's going to be no repercussions, they all cut loose, don't they? The repercussions come for Saul on the road to Damascus, don't they? I love Saul. I picture him riding along on his horse. He's the, I mean, his, this is the most glorious Jew in all the land, the most educated, the smartest. He's like a young Kennedy. He, sooner or later, he's heading to office, right? And he's traveling along there, and then what happens? The old saying, you get knocked off your high horse. Boy, he got knocked off, didn't he? He's laying in the ground. He went from being absolutely full of himself one minute to blind and can't even walk around. They got to lead him by the hand. Isn't that what happens to us when we get saved? God slowly but surely begins to show me and you that we're not worth saving. Not only are we not saved, we ain't worth saving. And not only are we not worth saving, anybody that does get saved is shown more and more after you're saved that you have nothing in you that's deserving. We're all just the same, aren't we? So we got Saul here. Now go back over to a uh, I tell you what, let's go to Galatians 1 and read what Saul says about himself. Which guy said, play, play the man before he got killed? Um, let's see, was that... Oh, who said it? Uh, I think Hugh Latimer said it to Ridley. Yeah, yeah, yeah he did. That's a good one, too. He, if y'all don't know that one, I, was it Bloody Mary that killed them? I think, so. I think it was Bloody Mary. Y'all know the, the Church of England, uh, Henry VIII joined in the Reformation, not because of any religious beliefs, because he didn't want to pay the Pope for a divorce, and there was argument there. So he, he had the churches. All he did overnight was claimed all the, the Catholic Church's property, denounced the Pope, and made himself the head of the church. But the people in England did go along. The people were seeing the gospel and the truth. And, and while Elizabeth, Henry's daughter Elizabeth, was in there, she was, seems to have been a believer, things went well. But after Elizabeth, Mary came to the throne, who they called Bloody Mary. Well, why they call her Bloody Mary? She was a devout Catholic and immediately started persecuting the, the Christians. And Bloody Mary had a great man of God. Hugh Latimer was his name, and he had a friend, Ridley. They were put to death. And Courtney just mentioned it. As they were about to, to burn them, I think they burned them at the stake, as they were about to burn them, Latimer leaned over to Ridley and he said, play the man, Ridley. Play the man. You know what he meant? Act like a man. In other words, we're not going to sit up here and cry and squeal. We're going to die like Christians. Act the man. And they acted the man. Paul told me and you to do the same thing. He said, quit you like men. That means act like men, doesn't it? Now, I know um, he's not disparaging ladies. Y'all know when you tell somebody, be a man. He, Gabriel and Sienna are outside yesterday, and she's riding him, or he's riding her like a horse. And, of course, she rears up the buck, and he goes forward, so they bang heads, right? Well, here he comes crying. Well, what do I tell him? Oh, you a big boy. Be a man, you know? Hey, it's just, that's what, but, again, it's the same thing. If y'all never read about these saints that were killed and persecuted, you ought to. You ought to see what it took for me and you to get the gospel. If we would read more about that, we wouldn't take our Bible so light. Thousands upon thousands of men and women have died. Said so you can have that book right there in front of you. 
Now Paul says in Galatians 1.11, he said, I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. He said, for I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Where did Paul get his message from? Christ. Later he goes to Jerusalem to make sure he's on the same page with the apostles. But he says, You have heard of my conversation in times past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. That's what Paul did. Paul said later that he hailed men, women, and children, would go out and, and get them, lock them up, and bring them to have them persecuted. Do y'all think he ever got over that? No. But you know, God let him. God could have stopped him, didn't he? Well, why didn't God stop him? Because all things work together for God's good. You say, well, those people he killed, that's not fair. Oh, it's not fair that they went off to get a martyr's reward in heaven? That he, he killed them before they could commit more vile sins? They're not upset, are they? You say, well, it's not fair to Paul. It's not. Who's God going to use more than anybody with the exception of Jesus Christ to spread the gospel? Paul. And so what is Paul's problem going to be he's going to have to fight against? Pride. What did Paul have on his mind every day? What he did. All the people he had killed. You talk about keep you humble. Yeah. You know, it's an amazing thing. I heard uh, a teacher I like teaching a class one time, and he said, let me ask you all something. <clears throat> Who is the greatest theologian that ever lived? And people say, well, see, Luther, Calvin, you know, Jonathan Edwards. It's Apostle Paul, isn't he? He's the greatest theologian that ever lived. He, he wrote more than any other. He's the greatest, isn't he? Who's the greatest evangelist that ever lived? Paul. Paul, isn't he? I mean, look, Whitfield did a lot, but he didn't do what Paul did. I heard a man estimate one time that Paul walked over 22,000 miles in his life. I mean, this man spent his life. He literally preached himself to death, didn't he? And then they beheaded him. Who's the greatest teacher that ever lived? Paul. Who is the greatest pastor, the most loving pastor that cared for the church? Paul. Paul said that what weighed him down more than anything else was the care of the church. And what was Paul before God saved him? He was the worst sinner you can find. And I don't mean he was into filth. He was self-righteous and religious persecuting the church. And what did God use him for? Whatever he wanted. If you don't believe in election and the power of God, you're not reading a story. People act like Paul was just, he was picked because of what he is. No, God made him what he is to use him. And so he's going to use this man more than any other. And this man prayed for to have a thorn in his flesh removed. And we don't know if that was illness, if it was the memory of what he had done, or if it was just the Judaizers. We don't know. But was Paul constantly persecuted and under attack? He prayed for something to be removed for him so he could do his job better. And you know what the Lord told him? No. My grace is sufficient for you. He, he prayed for it three times. Paul would say, my prayer wasn't answered. Yes, it was. The answer is no. The answer is no. You're going to do the job better with these things. In other words, you need all these things so that you totally and absolutely depend on me. It's the story of Gideon, isn't it? 32,000 to fight a war, and what God says, too many. Get rid of anybody that wants to go home. 22,000 went home immediately. Of course they did. He's now got 10,000. God says, too many. Take them down to the water and see who drinks, see who relaxes, and see who stays ready to fight while he drinks. 300 men Gideon's left with, and what did God say? Now, that's a good number. To fight 100,000? God said, no, you're not going to get the glory from this field. I am. Y'all imagine Paul. Can you imagine when Paul first goes back to Jerusalem, the shame of showing his face to both sides? The shame of seeing your friends. He, look, I, it's one of the reasons I don't live where I grew up, because I hate what I was so much growing up. I, don't, I just don't want to. I hate it. And, but Paul, it goes back to Jerusalem. What's he going to see? Christians who scared he, he's there to kill him, a secret agent. And what about the other side? A turncoat. Would you want to go back? And yet what did he do over and over? He kept going back. He says in Romans why he kept going back. He said, if it were possible, I would give up my own salvation if my people, my people the Jews could be saved. He wasn't lying. He was serious. Eventually what cost him his life? Going to Jerusalem, didn't it? 
It did. And so this is a man that God's going to use. But what did God do? God prepared him, Paul said, from his mother's womb. Think about that. Was Paul a Jew? Was he a Jew born a Jew, not a proselyte? Was he from one of the best of the two tribes? Yes. How about this? Could he speak Hebrew? Yes. Was he a Roman citizen? Yes. Why would God make sure he was a Roman citizen? Because he's going to have to travel freely throughout the Roman Empire, isn't he? Was he sent to train under the greatest teacher they ever had? Yes. Did he? I mean, seriously, can you all not see God preparing this man? And the whole time, who's getting all the glory from all of that? He is. It's like, I mean, it's like sharpening a knife so the knife can shine. No, what do you sharpen a knife for? To use it. And when the time came, what did God do? He grabbed a hold of Paul and started using him. Now, we've got the picture that way in many men in Scripture. Moses is a good example. Where did God make sure Moses grew up at? In Pharaoh's house. Did Moses have a good education? Did Moses have military training? Did Moses lack anything? And who was actually training him the whole time? God had him there getting ready for what God was going to use him for. Okay? <clears throat> All right. Um, uh, let's see. Go back over to uh, Acts chapter 4. No, Acts 8 4. I'm sorry. Acts 8 4. There's two words used here that I want to want to use just to kind of make a point. In Acts 8, 4 it says, Therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Now it says that they all were scattered out of Jerusalem except the apostles. You've got to always look at the word all and, and keep it in context. Okay, All doesn't have to mean 100%. For instance, we know that Jesus committed Mary to John's care, right? So wherever John is, Mary's probably there. We also know that John Mark's mother had a house in Jerusalem. A couple chapters later, they're going to be meeting there, aren't they? So either they all 100% were scattered, and when Paul gets saved, it says the church had peace for a little while. Maybe they came back. Or when it says they were all scattered, it just means the majority of them. Okay? But for whatever reason it was, they're scattered. And it says, they. Now, who is this they? Is it the apostles? No. It's the common people, isn't it? They that were scattered went abroad everywhere preaching the word. Now, y'all see the word preaching there? It's a shame that it's translated that way, in my opinion, because the word in verse 4 is evangelizing. They went everywhere evangelizing. What does evangelize mean? Do y'all know what evangel means? Euangelos, gospel. They went everywhere gospeling. They went everywhere talking about the good news. Anybody that has received good news, what do they talk about? The good news. Do y'all see who's doing this? Look, I say this because today people say something along these lines. Well, spreading the gospel is the preacher's job. You want to really be technical? It's not. The preacher's job is teaching you so you can pray. That's how it's been done. And the apostles trained all these men and women, and then what happened? Off they go. Do you have to be a man to evangelize? How about Priscilla? Yeah, yeah Wayne? Oh, that, that verse 4 right there, they, you was talking about, is that that 120 that was empowered by the Holy Spirit? It was part of that. They'd be part of it, yeah. But at one point, there's over 5,000 of them, isn't it? Oh, yeah. The whole church, thousands of them scattered, aren't they? And everywhere they go, what do they do? They, they preach the gospel. Preaching the gospel, you don't need a look how to say this, hey, they have turned the job of a preacher today in seminaries and whatnot. They've made it to be a position that it's really not in the Scriptures. You remember what the apostles said? We covered this. They told him, look, y'all get deacons to handle that stuff. We need to stick to the Word of God in prayer. And so basically what it is, is you're going to make a lot more converts training a group of people than one man, a group sending one man. Now I'm not saying that we don't support missionaries and send missionaries. Of course we do. But every single believer is a preacher, aren't we? When you get to verse 5 it says, Then Philip, now this is not Philip the Apostle, this is Philip one of the seven deacons. It was with Stephen. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. Now in verse 5, it's a different word. 
okay? It's well, cariso. I know y'all help that, but that's the word that's always translated preach. Preach means to publicly expound the Word of God. And that's what Philip's doing. But all them other people were out there evangelizing. You know how most people hear the gospel and get saved? Through a friend of a family member. Seriously, that's how most people get saved. You think about how did you hear the gospel? Most cases it's going to be somebody started talking to you. Somebody made you aware. I can say honestly in my life that the person that first even mentioned getting saved, that even opened my eyes that there was such a thing as, uh, as somebody that I, I'd rather be around anybody in the world but this person. But God used them. I don't know what their salvation is. I have no idea. But I know this. It's always this way. So how are, how are people brought into the group? You know, we were sitting here one Sunday. And we were talking about gifts. This has been a while back. We were just sitting here one day. I think, I can't remember. It might have been at the other house. I can't remember. But anyway, as we were sitting there, I was just bringing up how, you know, we hear the Word of God and whatnot. And I said, let me ask you all, look, for instance, I, I believe I used Chris and Dina, but really that's not accurate. It's Al, right? Everybody remember Mr. Al? Al sitting there. And I said, how many people in this group heard the gospel or, or got here through Chris and Dina. About half the group did. Y'all know Chris and Dina have the gift of gab. They're just, they're, he, I had, anytime I got to go visit, I went to see Maddie the other day and asked Chris, you want to go? And Chris always, yeah, I'll go. I like that because I don't know how to make small talk. If it's, if it's talking about the scripture, I'm fine. But when it's not, if you don't have this affliction, you don't know what I mean. Me and Lexi share it. So we both understand. We get put on a spot eating dinner with somebody and I'm looking at her and she's looking at me. And it's not that I don't like the person. It's just I don't know what to say. <laughs> Gina's got the gift of gab. They got a group at Gina's house Monday night that I preached the gospel to. And you know why? Gina invited them. But at this particular time, it was like half the people in the group. And it was a, all, everybody was there. It was the, all, the whole bunch. And I said, well, how did all this happen? Well, I heard it from them. Where'd they hear it from? From them? Where'd they hear it from? I think from Chris or Dina. Where'd they hear it from? Al? Al preached to Chris. I mean, this is how God works. And it's, it's I don't want to make trivialize this, but y'all know why they come up with pyramid schemes, don't you? That's the most effective method of spreading something. Look, I'm not knocking them. I don't know anything about them. My experience has been if you've got a product that's worth something, it's going to be on the shelf somewhere. <laughs> You're not going to have to do that. But people do get into them, don't they? Because the whole premise is it's exponential growth. That's the fastest form of growth, isn't it? Well, how's the gospel go forth? God knows it's the same way. Y'all know the human body grows this way. I wish Esther was here to tell us. Esther was telling us one time how when, when the actual sperm gets into the egg, how it begins to multiply. It's, she knew the numbers. It starts out with this many cells, and then it's this many, and it's this many, and just soon what do you have? It's giant. God's taken that little church and doing this with it. You know within two centuries what that little church is going to do? Conquer the world. It's going to conquer the known world. You say, no, it didn't. Yes, it did. Don't you ever believe that the barbarians conquered Rome? They did not. They flooded over the, the, and ruined it politically, but that's not what happened. What happened to the Roman Empire is Christianity spread throughout the empire so strong that the emperor had to change the state religion from paganism to Christian. It don't mean everybody was saved, but what happened? They, they, folks, they brought the empire to its knees. And they've done it many times throughout the world, haven't they? And then the opposite happens. The church gets a time of peace and it gets complacent. And then what happens? Okay. Everything starts to go the other way. Look at our country today. Can you believe that 200 years ago, some of the greatest revivals that ever took place were taking place in New England? In New York? Can you believe that? Philadelphia? Can you believe that? Have y'all ever watched the Philadelphia sporting game? Who's the worst fans in the NFL? The Philadelphia folks. I don't want to go to Philadelphia. The city of brotherly love. Are you kidding me? Do y'all know that the gospel went into the world from London and Philadelphia? It really did. God did that. God is in control and God's doing it. And God chooses the tools he's going to use. And God enables the person to do what he's given them. Our job is just to figure out what it is we can do. Everybody can talk to folks about the gospel. 
Look, I'll, I'll meet with anybody y'all want to share the gospel with them. But if you're asking me to go knock on their door and talk to them, I ain't equipped to do it. I'm just telling you the truth. I mean, I, look, I used to try that, but I learned, hey, I'm not equipped to do that. You ought to hear Art tell a story about when he first got down to Code Inn, he decided, okay, and he, Art's got the gift of gab. He said, yeah, I'm going to go knock on every door in Code Inn and see, talk to people about their salvation. You ought to talk to him today about what he's seen and heard. Amazing stuff. I went one time with a, a man me and Wayne knew, and a fella had a hatchet in his hand. He opened the door and he had a hatchet. And the guy's trying to talk to him about the Lord. I'm standing there trying to learn, and the guy's got the hatchet the whole time. He's doing that hatchet in his hand like that. And I'm thinking, this ain't going to end well. Huh? <laughs> the, the, the truth of the matter is this, in my opinion, and, and what I see in Scripture is this. Don't go around kicking open doors. You don't know. You keep your eye open and watch God open the doors for you and you stick your foot in when He opens them. Yes. You look for a little opening in the conversation, just anything. Is it 2 Timothy or 1 4 2? Preach the Word of God yep. in season, be instant, and out of season, yep. rebuke and reprove yep. with long suffering and doctrine. That's right. Now, if you do something in season and out of season, all right, let me give you an example. If you hunt deer in season, when do you hunt them? October through November. If you hunt them out of season, when do you hunt them? <laughs> From February back to October. So what's he basically saying? Always. You be ready always. And it's my job, honestly, to, to teach all that. To, to, that's what my job is to teach you how to talk to people. And look, it does, you don't have to know a whole lot at all. You really don't. All you've got to know is the basics of what Jesus Christ has done for you. And remember this, people are going to see more gospel than they ever hear. They're going to be watching you and seeing something. They're going to observe a change, a security, and a peace, and they're going to say, something, what's going on here? And that's how most people come to see the gospel. It's never like people think, look, Paul did not go to each town knocking door to door. If you read when Paul got to the town, he started in the synagogue. Well, why? That's where people profess to want to know about God. That's logical, isn't it? But then it says he would talk to people in the marketplace. You know what that means? He, I tell you what one of y'all ought to do sometimes. I'm not trying to make anybody guilty, but everybody ought to go over and go one day with Wayne. You know, I ain't trying to lift Wayne up. I'm telling y'all, Wayne's got the gift God gave him for talking to people. Everybody likes Wayne. I prayed about that. Well, you prayed for it, yeah. The same thing you said, I just can't do this. Yeah. And, uh, being taught and, and took those verses and memorized them, asked God to help me. Yeah. It comes out. Hey, if, they, if that's what he's going to use you for, he's going to do it. Go to Lowe's with Wayne. Then we'll run up there one day and get a bolt we need or something. Take five minutes. Two hours later, we get back. You know why? He, everybody in there, and nobody gets mad at him. He just, he's got that ability. Figure out what it is you can do. Folks, pray to the Lord and do it. He, you know, it's a, I told y'all one time, at, at one of the favorite things anybody's ever said to me about any of y'all is a guy told one, one time, he's from Pascagoula. He, we were at a, a tool place way over somewhere else, and I said, yeah, I got a good friend lives in Pascagoula. He said, who? And I told him about Wayne. He said, oh, the Jesus guy. <laughs> and y'all know what I said? What a pro yeah, amen, the Jesus guy. That's him. That's our job. And you know, it, is it going to result in personal attacks? Yeah. What's it matter? Can it result in a physical attack? It might, but me and you, we need to be ready to talk to people about the Lord, don't we? Whoever wanted to hoard good news? I mean, people want to treat the gospel like it's a hot stock tip. Like they, you know, no. Is there any limit to the goodness of Christ? Is there any limit to His inheritance? How's it limited by more people coming in? It's not. The more people that comes in, the more glory is given to the Lord. Ain't that what we want to do is glorify? Under the bed. Yeah, that's, that's right. That's a good one, Gina. Jesus said, no man lights a candle and hides it under the bed. He lights a candle to do what? To let the light shine. Y'all realize what the lit candle is? It's the Spirit of God in you. That's the lit candle. He said, shine. Let it shine. You don't have to know hardly any scripture to just let people know, hey, I can tell you one thing. He, you know, I love the, he, I know some people don't like me to talk about the chosen, but it, it, look, whatever. <laughs> um, but Mary, 
Mary didn't know anything, and, that, and I'm not saying this is how it was in real life, just in the show, okay, it's entertainment. But she said, look, I can't tell you to Nicodemus. You know the Scripture way better than me, but I can tell you this. I was this way, and now I'm that way. And the only thing that happened in between is Him. Now that's what people ought to see in a Christian, okay? All right, any questions about that? No? All right, well, Lord willing, we'll take up Paul and maybe some of his history next time and really look at him. And I'm really looking forward to it from here on out, okay? All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for the inspiration of the Spirit that put these things down for us. We thank you for you even being willing to reveal yourself to us. Lord, we thank you for the sacrifice of our Savior, for all that you do for us, for the leadership of your Spirit, and we thank you for the love and kindness of like-minded believers. We thank you for the peace and unity that we share together, and we ask that you please help us and enable us to spread the gospel. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.